You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to this Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins. You can find me at Conquest3 on Twitter. And today I have the huge privilege of speaking with Alex de Groot, a highly sought after former sell side TMT analyst that's worked with numerous investment banks and brokerage firms and equity firms. And I'm thrilled to have him on here because he's got such a wide breadth of knowledge going back from joining the city in 1996. So 27 years or so expertise. And um, I discovered I say discovered because he's not an island, but I discovered Alex via a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Phil Oakley. He was talking about um, getting some guests onto the Investing Matters show and live panel sessions I had. And we did, and we talked about this chap called Alex the Groot, who's an absolute specialist in the tech sector and sell side. So here we are. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Peter. It's an absolute pleasure to be to be with you. Thank you. Right, Alex, we're going to start um, our conversation, if I may, with with you sharing with us all the way back, right, at university, what did you study and what did you, what did you attain from your degree? I want to go all the way back there. Where did you study? What did you attain? Sure. So way back in the distance of, distance of time, in the sort of early to mid-90s, I did an undergraduate degree um, in history at Durham and then I did a master's in I mean I think it was called European Management Studies at, um, at the London School of Economics um, and graduated in 96 and got my first job in the city or in investing shortly thereafter um, with a small firm which uh, was called Albert E Sharp which was a Midlands based um, securities firm and asset manager and I got the job really through a friend of a friend and it was a pretty small firm I mean this is the very early days of the internet so you know the way you got jobs back then was very different um, I didn't really know anything about stocks and shares or investing or finance I'd done a sort of social sciences type education you know it wasn't a hard maths guy it wasn't really a you know an accounting guy um, but this this investing lark sounded quite interesting. And so I joined this little firm uh, really as a grad, to be honest, um, helping out on high net worth portfolios, a little bit of institutional equity analysis, a little bit of um, going to site visits when the fund managers couldn't go, a little bit of taking notes, a little bit of settlements. So... It wasn't a glamorous start, but it was a really good start in terms of breadth of opportunity. And um, for those that don't know the firm, this this firm, Albert T. Sharp, had a really good presence in the Midlands in particular with engineering companies, metal bashers. And it had helped a lot of these companies raise capital over like 50, 60 years. A very prominent firm, but it had built up um, an asset management business alongside so it's a hybrid firm, and that gave me a good hybrid exposure into investing and also the sort of more institutional side of corporate finance and equities. So you never really realize these things when you're quite young. I was probably only 23, 24, but it was a good starting point, and they put me through my exams. So back in the day, we used to do exams through an organization called the Securities Institute, um, since been superseded by the CFA, but back then it was called the IIMR. And so, again, this firm sort of put me through that and really over a very brief period, 12 to 18 month period, um, I learned a lot. And I learned from some very experienced guys, stockbrokers, analysts, sales guys, dealers. Um, and it was a good starting point. If I'd gone to do like a normal graduate recruitment thing at somewhere like KPMG or Ernst & Young, it would have been a lot more structured. It would have been a lot longer. And I would have had a lot less responsibility. But in a way, I was just sort of thrown in at the deep end. And at the time, it was a bit daunting. But I think looking back on it was a good thing. So 
I guess my message to grads or people who've recently left uni looking to get a job in investing, don't ignore the little guys, don't ignore the small firms, because sometimes they give you a leg up a lot quicker than in the more structured environment. And I think the other thing about my story that I should sort of get out there early day, early doors, is that, you know, I've, 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 I've built most of my career living in the north of England. Um, and historically, most of the opportunities in investing in finance have been in the city, the city of London. I have worked in the city of London, but, you know, 25, 26 years, well over half of that, two thirds has been working in Liverpool, Manchester, you know, working remotely. Um, so you, you can do it. You don't have to be in London. And these days with working from home and systems, better cloud-based systems, there's more opportunity to learn and develop. You can do your CFA remotely or online. So in, in, in a way, the world is easier now to sort of carve out a career away from, from London, if that's what you want. Um, and in a way, my sort of career has evolved in that way, albeit this is like 20 odd years ago. Nobody really knew what working from home was 20 years ago. Um, the cloud was was not a thing. Um, and one of my first jobs at this little firm, Albert T. Sharp, in fact, this will make people laugh, was to do what were called McCarthy cards. And so in the in the library, believe it or not, this company had a library. In the library of Albert T. Sharp, they would have row upon row upon row of McCarthy cards. And McCarthy cards were hard card-based bits of news cuttings on companies and economic events. And I would be sent to get the relevant McCarthy card on GKN or Unilever or, or, or what was then called Raypool, which was the early Vodafone. Um, so I would trundle along to the, to the library. I would open up the rack of cards, V for Vodafone, G for GKN, so on and so forth. And then you would bring them back and then the people would get their magnifying glasses and they would look at every story. It's old school, isn't it now? I mean, it makes us laugh thinking about it. It's not that long ago, but this is before Google search. This is before things were really filed online. But in a way, in, a get, in another way, Peter, it was a good way again to learn things and to learn the processes. And you know, I was a guy in my twenties then, early twenties, but I was working with some brokers and some guys who were in their sixties. So these guys were born in like 1930. So they, they didn't really get tech at all. They could just about use a computer. Um, but most things were done manually. Dealing was still done on the phone, voice broking. Um, and and just one final anecdote, one of the analysts I, I sort of looked up to a lot was a guy called Colin, who was an engineering analyst, who was then in his late 50s. And he sat bolt upright in front of a, you know, like a preacher would stand in front of a lectern. And on the lectern was his squared maths paper where he would do his calculations with his pencil and his rubber, operating margin, you know, re return on assets, blah, 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 all done on paper with pencil. I mean, that was too old school for me, but it was interesting to see that there were still guys in the city that did it that way. Um, but things were about to change rapidly. Anyway, that's a long, very long winded way of explaining how I started in the mid to late 90s and the environment, you know, I started in. No, that's brilliant. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant consensus that you've given there regarding the the journey and the beauty of of doing things almost um in a way that enables you to get a greater learning and understanding you said that you were throwing at the, in, in at the deep end but i think the beauty of sometimes as you said being in a smaller firm is that it enables you to do that that you know they thrust into the forefront of it all there are opportunities when somebody doesn't turn up or somebody's having a day off and they go you know what Who's the guy that, oh, oh, Alex can go. And you go, what, me? I don't know what I'm doing. But you go there and you have to learn on your feet sort of thing. And that's that's almost how it was done in the up north and in the Midlands. You know, you had to learn on your feet. You had to hit the ground running. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's absolutely brilliant. OK, Alex, you, you then went on to work at Charterhouse Bank, ING, Credit Agricole, Daniel Gordon, Peel Hunt, Senka Securities, and latterly until February 2023, Arden Partners. During your career, it's encompassed equities, fund management, and corporate broking finances. Um, please can you share with our investors and listeners your greatest lessons and learnings from your career in relations to, firstly, equities, please. So that, you know, we've got a lot of um, investors that listen to this, professional as well. What's been your greatest lessons, please, Alex? 
on the equity um, side? On the equity side, I would say always, always look to learn. Don't ever think you know it all. Um, new things come along, whether that's technology, trading patterns, macro events. Don't ever close your eyes or your ears to new developments. Um, you, you know, you never know everything. However clever you think you are, however much spirit experience you are, there's always something coming along that's going to teach you something new. I guess at the moment that would probably be AI, artificial intelligence. But but just in general, don't switch off. The market is evolving all the time and industries are evolving and macro is evolving and you never know it all. Experience is a great teacher, um, but you, you've got to be fresh. You've got to remain open to new ideas. I mean, one of the great things about working with you, Peter, and, and some of the other guys is that I'm picking up from you new influences and new inf information which I hadn't had before. Um, so, so I would recommend everybody to remain open minded about everything and willing to learn. I mean, that, that would be my big learning. I mean, just to give you one anecdote, you know, when I started back in the 90s with Phil Oakley, you know, brokers and banks had big trading floors. And you would have a morning meeting and you would give your stock ideas or talk about the news and everybody would then hit the phones and ring their clients and tell them what the news was and tell them what to do, make a recommendation and try and generate some business. It was quite a labor intensive process, not that tech led, a um, bit old school, but that's the way the city worked. Fast forward 20, 25 years. You know, if you have a morning meeting, you'll probably do it on a Zoom call or on Teams. There's no big trading flaws. A lot of trading is done by algos or computers. Um, forums are massive. So the market has evolved hugely in my career and will continue to evolve. So, again, that's another aspect of sort of willing to be receptive to new ideas. Absolutely. I think it's a very important point you make there about continual learning. We've all got to be students of this market because every day is a school day. We're all finding out. We've got the economists coming out. We've got the Fed, the ECB all going, scratching their heads going, um, we don't know what we're doing, essentially is what they're telling us. You know, yeah. and we're, we're, we're working with the market and the market's not working with us. It's just reactive sometimes we've got to be, but we've got to be open to, like you say, to learning and not thinking we know it all already because we'll just get our heads smashed, you know, and our portfolios and will be emptied as well. Yeah, absolutely. And don't be afraid to admit you've made a mistake or, or, or absolutely. You, you know, to, to sort of have bad experiences. I mean, it is a portfolio game. And in a portfolio game, you're going to have one or two losers. You know, you can't, not every stock pick is going to be a winner. Um, so you've got to learn from those ones that go wrong. And yeah, so, I mean, be receptive. I think that would be my main learning from my career. Um, and things evolve and change and, and try and go with it if you can. Brilliant. Thank you for that response. Now, I'm going to ask a similar sort of question. Now, what, what are your greatest lessons and learnings with regards to your time in the highly competitive corporate broking and finance side of the industry? Yeah, I mean, if I was to give advice from my point of view, I would I would say to anybody at the beginning of their career or even midway through their career, look at your network. Is it, is it how you want it to be? Are there any deficiencies? Um, what are you doing to strengthen your network? Are you a good communicator? Not everybody's a good communicator. Um, are you a social person? Are you are you in touch with the people you need to be in touch with? Again, don't be afraid to reappraise your current situation and say, actually, do you know what? I don't I've, I don't have any contacts from that firm I worked at 15 years ago. That's a bit of a mistake. You know, let me re-engage with those guys. See what the chat is. See what's going on because. One of the things, again, about investing in the city is that people move around um, and sometimes they move geographies and they move overseas. I, you know, work with a French bank in my um, sort of mid, mid to late 20s. Great learning. Um, look at your network, reappraise, develop. I, I think at the moment we're living post-COVID in a great era for going to events, taking part in forums. For example, the forum you hosted a few weeks ago, Peter. Um, there's lots of things you can learn from. If you're in London for a few days, try and search out, um, try and search out a PI, you know, private investor forum, or or maybe a VC firm's hosting a sort of demo evening. Um, and finding out about these events is a little bit of trial and error, but we've got more information flow probably now than ever before. So, again, de depending on your personality, I would say look at your network and um, 
is it is it is it is it helping me don't waste time with people with negative energy um you know personal bugbear of mine and look to look to learn i mean we're, we're very privileged when we invest in tech or life sciences companies digital companies we're generally meeting people who are let's be honest a bit cleverer than we are and we can learn a lot from these guys um, we may be able to bring the sort of investment piece and the, the finance piece but they bring the sort of in, innate deep dive understanding of ai or coding or genomes or something um so yeah i i think being aware of your network and strengths and weaknesses and and looking to refine your your personality i mean none of us are the finished article even if we're 45 50 we're still still learning I love that. Not the finished article. I think that's a brilliant, brilliant way of putting it. Um, and we all need to continue to believe that we can improve ourselves as well. Very good point. Now, with regards to the advisory side of it, um, do you want to share with us, really? Because I think it is a nuance that many people don't understand, um, Alex. How does the advisory side of the city actually work? OK, great question. So if you're quoted on AIM as a company, public company, you're going to have to have what's called a nomad and you're probably going to have to have a broker a nomad is is a nominated advisor and it's an obligation upon any public company that's on aim to have a nomad and that nomad will help the company with regulatory requirements disclosure requirements and the whole sort of legal side of being a public company and there's no way around it you've got to have it if you don't have it your shares will be suspended okay so they are advisors they're typically not advising on strategy or on finance, but they are advising on market expectations, requirements around disclosure, and the technicalities with regards to fundraisings, for example. So the advisors are working with the company generally um, around a specific issue, um, but there's an ongoing role of maintenance, care and maintenance that the nomad must fulfill. The broker, um, can often be the nomad, but maybe a separate firm. The broker is generally more engaged in raising money, fundraising. So if a company needs to raise 10 million to build a new factory or develop, develop a new product line, then the broker will be charged with approaching the shareholders, um, taking soundings um, according to the appropriate regulatory requirements, and then you know raising the capital at whatever price is deemed appropriate by the company and the institutions. So the nomad and the broker can be a role which is wrapped up into one, but quite often when you look at an RNS in the morning, you'll see that there's a nomad and a broker. Okay. Now on on aim, away from aim, sorry, so that's aim, away from aim on the main market, the regulatory environment is a bit different. You tend to find companies have two, maybe three brokers, no nomad. That's not a function on on the main market. Um, and again, those guys, it's a UK, it's a UK phenomenon. They're basically charged with advising the company in terms of its capital markets approach and the perception of the investor base towards that company and um, how are they um, managing the company in terms of governance, best practice and, and things like, for example, the city code. So advisors tend to get paid a flat fee, um, which can be anything from basically 50 to 150 a year, but they make the real money. On, on raises, capital raises. So two to three years ago, 2021, 22, there was a lot of capital being issued on the main market and AIM. Generally, if you're a broker, you're earning between three and 5% of the raise. So if the raise is 100 mil, then the commission paid to the broker is three to 5 million, okay? And when you look at an RNS in the morning and you see an IPO, you'll often see the gross money raised. So that's the total money raised. But then you'll see the net money raised and the net money is the gross minus the commission paid to the advisors. So advisors make their money generally through flat fees and fundraisings. That's how the city works. So basically on the equities side, if there's no fundraising going on, it's a tough gig. It's hard to make money. Um, conversely, when when there's a lot of capital flowing, a lot of fundraisings going on, as there were two or three years ago, um, it's happy days. and and you know, the gearing, the operational gearing for these firms can be massive in a bull market. Conversely, in a negative market or a sort of depressed market, which is probably how we would characterize the UK right now, is not a lot of business. And um, then you get the negative effect of operational gearing. 
fixed cost base, not much revenue, loss making. Um, so that's in a nutshell, that's basically how it works. There's all sorts of advisors in M&A, mergers and acquisitions and strategy and, and PR and communications. Um, but in a nutshell, a public company is going to have a lawyer, an auditor, an accountant, a broker, possibly a nomad, possibly a PR company, maybe one or two others. It's, it's a long list. They're spending a lot of money on fees. Um, and people who, who aren't enamored with this maybe maybe you know maybe they're onto something but nonetheless there are there are a lot of advisors that sort of sit around the outskirts of a public company um and uh it's important for investors to be aware of this because companies don't they don't act in isolation they generally do on the basis of advice from various stakeholders um and of course there's a cost to doing deals and that cost is the advisory fees so so I've done that at most firms I've worked for, um, depending on what the corporate finance function says, depending on what compliance says, you're more or less involved. Some companies are very tight on analysts getting involved, um, but historically that wasn't the case. They were very involved. So it, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a gray area, the extent to which there is a genuine Chinese war. Um, and in a way, there couldn't be a genuine Chinese wall, if you think about it. Um, but nonetheless, you know, compliance is a much hotter topic today in the city than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. That's for sure. Um, so I hope that summarizes how the advisory side works. But as I say, companies don't act in invite. You know, the CEO has got to run the company. He hasn't got time to talk to all the shareholders about, you know, ESG. Um, that comes from the advisory base. And, you know, boards meet, what, four times a year, six times a year, um, depending on depending on what's up for debate. Um, and, and at those meetings, they will have an agenda and the agenda will be led often by the advisor or the non-execs. So so that's 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 really the advisory piece. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Alex. Now, I want to I go on to talk about you being closely involved in the IPO in the early years of Rightmove and the UK property porthole. Um, also, advisory and broker to the likes of Reach, Go Compare, WPP, and STV. Do you want to share some of your experience yeah. with those sort of roles? That sure. Had? Some ma massive roles that looks like to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, Right Move is a really interesting one, I guess, because right now everybody's got a real downer on the UK stock market. But actually, Right Move is a good example of how the UK can evolve big growth companies. So Rightmove was spun out of an estate agency group called Countrywide back in the mid 2000s. Um, and, and the sort of visionary estate agents had worked out that customers were increasingly searching for properties to buy and rent online. This is web 1.0. So Google was in its early days. Rightmove's genius was you didn't have to Google search it. You just went straight to Rightmove in your, in your, you know, in your toolbar. Um, and it became a default setting for many people. Um, so they didn't have to pay away in search engine optimization. They didn't have to pay away a lot of money. So it's high margin. And it became a brand and they were all over TV brand building. And Countrywide and the other holders, which included Skipton Building Society, decided to monetize this asset that they developed. Um, problem was, back then, it was not that long ago, but it feels like a million years ago, back then, People didn't really know how big a company like Rightmove or Auto Trader could become. They didn't realize it would do like 200 million of EBITDA. Um, was it sustainable? Was it vulnerable to the housing market? Blah, blah, blah. Um, in fact, the model has proved remarkably resilient over a long period of time. And the shares have basically been a one way bet. I mean, from memory, the IPO price was about three pounds. Um, it was a relatively easy IPO to do. Um, most people sort of got the model, although nobody really imagined it would be as big as it is today. And the CEO at the time was a genius called Ed Williams, ex-management consultant who had a lot of vision, and was quite pure in his vision. He didn't want to expand in the US. He didn't want to expand overseas. He just wanted to dominate the UK property market. And, and really his target, his target was the classified advertising revenue that the newspapers used to have for, for selling houses. He thought, I'm going to get that because I can provide better return on investment. I can 24-7 feedback loop. You can stick all your houses on there, dear Mr. Estate Agent, and we're going to charge you 300 quid a month. 
with a small ratchet, depending on how many houses. The model was genius. It worked very well. And um, the IPO was a success. And it's largely never looked back. Um, and it was an absolute pleasure to be involved in that at the beginning and then subsequently, um, because it really gave me an insight into um, how internet businesses make money, good internet businesses, and where the dependencies might be and where the weaknesses might be. For example, being SEO dependent is always going to put you at risk slightly. Um, that was never the case with the big branded portals like Rightmove and to a lesser extent Zoopla and Autotrader where people would go direct to site. Um, so the other thing it taught me really was that you don't need to, if you've got a genius idea, you don't necessarily need to go and launch in Denmark or the States. Just focus on what you're doing and in your market. And, and true enough, Rightmove became a 50, 60, 70% operating margin business, really through best practice and through looking after their customers. And their customers were property developers, new home developers, uh, estate agents, basically. Um, so that was early on in my career. That was a that was a good client to have, good client to work with, and a lucrative client to have. And it gave me an insight into digital businesses, really before they became mainstream. So that when the likes of Money Supermarket and Go Compare came along later, I understood, you know, what the key variables were. I understood what the key drivers were. Um, and, and really gave me an early look at these business models, which have gone on to be very successful, albeit they haven't scaled internationally. They've tended to stay in the UK. And a lot of people have said, well, why is that? Why don't they go and launch in France or something? But, but really the management have said, no, we're going to stick to this market because this is what we know. Um, and it's and, and good because they haven't done M&A and the M&A therefore hasn't sent them down a cul-de-sac or down a you know blind alley. Um, so that was great. I work with lots of other good corporates, mainly in the tech and media sectors. Um, some of them have been a bit old school and a bit challenged. Some of them have been high growth. Um, I think the common denominator has basically been um, that with the exception of right move, most sort of digital media or media companies are, are, are fairly cyclical in terms of their revenue and their performance trends. And so you've got to know where you are in the cycle because Things don't go up in a straight line. Right move is obviously different, but most of them have advertising revenue, and that tends to be quite tightly correlated with the advertising, with the economic outlook. Um, so it's a question of sort of peaks and troughs and um, knowing when to invest through the cycle as well. Um, but I've been privileged to meet some real entrepreneurs and work with some, some geniuses. You know, Sorrel obviously is the one everybody knows, um, but Ed Williams at Right move was great as well. And, you know, even amongst the smaller companies I've worked with, you know, I've met some really high quality businessmen, um, many of whom remain friends to this day and many of whom have gone on to do other things. It's a guy called Barry Bryan, who is the CEO of, of Creston, which was a PLC um, taken over by private equity about eight years ago. He's gone on to, to do very well in, 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 in private equity marketing. So, you know, again, back to the point about having a network. These are the clients I work with as an advisor and I've learned from them and I've tried to keep those relationships going through my career. Um, and, and likewise, I think, I hope, I've provided some value to these guys about the market, about what do investors think, how do we value a business? And, um, you, you know, I like to think it's a reciprocal relationship. But I think what's important for this podcast is that investors understand that, you um, you know, management is really key. When you're investing in a business, management is key. It can be the difference between, you know, a company outperforming and a company just flatlining. And, and the management piece is sometimes overlooked. I'm a great believer in, in, you know, only invest in a company if you've met the management. I think investing without meeting management is, is, is really, you're letting yourself down a little bit. So that, that, that's, that's, that's my learning there. Brilliant. Thank you for that full response. I really appreciate it. Now, you covered most of this, I think, in that response you've given me, but I'll ask this question anyway. You can add a little bit of nuance to it. You've been doing this now, Alex, for, for nearly three decades, 26, 27 years. Which of the companies which you were involved in or you've seen in the market that have surprised you and surpassed your highest expectations and why? 
what did they have? You mentioned management already. You mentioned um, Sir Martin Sorrell. You mentioned um, Ed Williams um, regarding Right Move. Which other companies have surpassed? And you thought, wow, they've done amazingly well. I never thought they'd do as well as they did. Well, I have to say, Right Move does stand out like a sore thumb. Um, without without going on about it too much. And I think the reason is, is that they had a very clear sense of their addressable market and were able mm -hmm. to build their business model around the addressable market. I'm sure a lot of people watching or listening to the call will, will know the phrase TAM, total addressable market. And I think yeah. if you can define that accurately, it can en enable you to shape your your internal resources to, to attack that market. Um, so right me would stand out like a sore thumb. Um, I mean, I think most of the others it's a bit hard to categorize. I mean, I've worked with some marketing services businesses, which were buy and build stories. So the objective, I mean, Creston is one I've named, but there are others. Um, the objective was always to scale a business through M&A and then at the right time exit. So every every story is a bit different. So Right Move was always going to be a pure play digital growth story. Creston was always going to be a a buy and build marketing services story where you're doing lots of little deals and the strength of the story is around how well you do those deals and how well you integrate them. I repeat, M&A can often be a bit of a make or break for a lot of companies. A deal done well can give you a step up. A deal done badly can lead to impairment charges and, and, and sort of lots of unintended consequences. Um, I've also worked with some problem children. I mean, the, the, the funny thing is, is that you can actually make money out of bad companies. And now I, I might say counterintuitive, but for example, um, right now in the UK market, we've got this situation where a lot of smaller micro caps are getting written off or just like absolutely creamed on a daily basis. Um, and then they end up trading on incredibly low multiples and people give up. They're totally unloved. There's, there's, there's often value in some of these companies, but it takes a bit more strategic vision to realize that value. Um, and in this current interest rate cycle, I think we're going to find a lot of companies have a bit too much debt and they're paying a bit too much interest. But under the right refinancing conditions, there can be value in these companies if they can refi, maybe through issuing equity, maybe through asset sales. You can generate value sometimes from transferring value from debt to equity, basically. So. I guess what I'm saying is right move for the pure play, Creston WPP for the M&A, um, a little newspaper company I worked with a few years ago, Johnston Press, it's now called National World. Um, it was basically bust or in a really bad place, but through a combination of refi and some clever management, it was recapitalized and lived for another two years. So it is very much horses for courses um, and you can make money as an investor out of out of bad companies but you've got to be aware what the plan is what's your exit strategy with a company like right move there was never an exit strategy because it was always going to be a long-term digital growth story with a lot of companies that get listed there is no such long-term plan it's a sort of three to five year plan based upon certain corporate actions um so i hope that doesn't over complicate it but um Again, my experience has, has, has benefited hugely from working with a variety of companies. Thank you for that. I think what, one of the difficulties that investors currently have and an ongoing um, problem that we all have is how we go about valuing these companies. Some of them are on the knees, like you say, completely unloved and undervalued, but it's getting to that particular position where we've learned so much or we've learned enough to be able to qualify in ourselves. What is the value of this company? And it, what's the value of somebody else to somebody else with this company? Is there a simplified way that you've learned, Alex, over 26, 27 years as to how to go about valuing any company? Um, sure. you know, obviously, tech companies are more difficult to value because of intangible value, uh, assets and so on and so forth. But what's your simplified strategy for valuing a company? And yeah, you can share I mean, that with our listeners, maybe. So, so you're absolutely right, Peter. So my natural bias is towards growth companies or tech companies or media companies, digital companies. I tend to steer away generally from asset backed valuations, but just because you say a lot of the companies I know and have been familiar with, they don't have any PPE. It's all intangible assets. 
you know, look at right moves balance sheet, there's nothing on it. So that's my natural tendency. In terms of what I would look for in terms of red flags or things to analyze, I, I'm a great believer in margins, you know, and what is the sustainability of a, of a margin for a given company? And how does that match with where we are in the cycle? So to give you one example, a company listed in London about a week ago called Cab Payments, which is a Forex provider. If you look at the screen, you'll see that their EBITDA margin last year was very high. I think it was like mid 40s. So the key question for investors with a company like this, is that margin sustainable? If yes, up to what level? If no, what's the downside? Because that margin on the sales is really what determines your earnings. And so that will feed through into your valuation. So the thing I look at probably above all else for most companies is sustainability of operating margin. And I guess it may be quite topical because, of course, at the moment, a lot of companies are seeing quite big inflationary pressures. So so margin for me, above all else, you know, what's the old expression, Pete? P profit for sanity, turnover for vanity. And, and, and I believe that. Um, elsewhere, I mean, DCFs are used by a lot of investors and analysts, discounted cash flows. They have a value. It's a little bit geeky, if I'm being honest. But they do have a value. And if, if you don't know how to do a DCF, it may be worth spending half an afternoon trying to learn how to do one. But apart from that, you know, I, I'm happy to stick with PE multiples or EBITDA multiples. Always look to see if a company's got a pension deficit or any 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 non-financial debt. Um, we all know what net debt is. We can find that from the balance sheet, gross debt minus cash. But sometimes they might have a pension that you don't know about or they may be on the hook for a deal that you don't know about, or there may be some other liabilities that you don't know about. So before you rely too much on the PE, the price earnings, just check the balance sheet, because you don't want to come a cropper with a big pension deficit, which isn't in the PE, but it's taking cash out of the company. So do you know what? One of the great things is you just, you just, you just learn all these little tricks and um, try and build up a picture of the company in your mind and then work out what the relevant metric is. I wouldn't steer too far away from PE, frankly, as long as you've got a feeling for, are those earnings sustainable? Are they growing? If so, why are they growing? Is this margin sustainable? Um, and then the other thing, which is not really financial, but important to equity stories, who owns the company? Who owns the company? Do the management have a big stake? For me, generally, that's ticking the box. Um, do private equity or, or strategics have a stake? Hmm, that's interesting. What does that mean? Um, you know, look at the structure of an IPO. How much of the IPO was companies selling and how much was them raising new money? Always a bit suspicious of companies where the shareholders are bailing out at the IPO, um, but not raising growth capital. So that's not financial as, it, as, as such, but it's an important part of the story because as a private investor in particular, you know, you don't want to be the guy that picks up the pieces. You know, you don't want to be the guy that's a mug. Um, and so looking at the shareholder base and how that's evolved. If a company comes to market at a billion, but it was last transacted at 500 million, how has it increased 500 million in value? What have been the levers? Um, a little bit of cynicism can help without being too cynical, because being too cynical, I think probably it's not a good thing. But a little bit of cynicism can help. Um, and again, try and get in front of the management, whether that's on one of our podcasts or on an earnings call or just on the telly or whatever. But you've got to look at the eyes. You've got to see the management. Make some brilliant points there. I love the fact you touched on pension deficits there. It's rarely ever talked about. And we've got so many companies now that are going, you know, we're, we're on the hook for this pension and we can't deal with it. And they're, they're basically selling the, the pension book off, you know, yeah. and moving on to try and get away from it. Uh, so, yeah, fantastic points there, Alex. Very well made. Now, I want to touch on some personal stuff now with yourself, because obviously you've worked inside of investment banks before, European banks, etc. cetera. Um, what do you do about your own personal investing? What's your methodology? What's your strategy? What sort of research do you do? What's your asset allocation? Just give me Alex's download okay, okay. on investing for himself. What do you do? Okay. So, so first thing to say is I try and avoid too much home bias. So what I mean by home bias is, is I live in the UK. I'm a British citizen. I've worked mainly in the UK, but 
you know, the UK is not 100% of my portfolio, right? And the UK is only 4% of the MSCI Global Benchmark Index. So, you know, I would encourage anybody to look closely at the makeup by geography of their portfolio. Um, and so I, I am unashamedly overweight the US in terms of my own pension and personal funds. And that's a mixture of company, direct company investing and quite a lot of funds. Um, some of the funds are locked up. Some of them I could access this afternoon. Um, the ETF market for me has been um, a, a big eye opener over the last few years. And I would encourage people to look at any of the providers, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, but there's loads. Um, and if you want to play AI at the moment, it's probably easier to do it through an ETF than it is through a direct equity place, certainly in the UK. Um, so in answer to your question, I try and avoid home bias. I am unashamedly overweight the US, not, not just because I like the US, but because it's where the most innovation comes from and it's where there's the most liquidity. Um, I'm increasingly turned on to markets like Japan as well and to some extent the other Asian markets like Vietnam. Um, so I hope that gives you a feeling for what I do. Um, we've got loads of great robo platforms. Um, our platform industry in this country is really good, I think. Um, we've got great forums. The information flow with YouTube and, and podcasts is very good, um, but you don't need to stick to UK micro caps. You really don't. I mean, I've worked in UK micro caps, so I know how it works and mm -hmm. I, I love to find a good one. Um, but, but if you'd just been in the UK for the last 10 years, your performance would be very different to if you'd had, if you'd followed, followed Warren Buffett, S&P tracker. Um, fees are the other thing that my real bugbear fees. Um, so keep an eye on what you're paying in terms of fees. Um, you know, it's getting more competitive, but there are people out there that will still gouge you. So it's worth looking at. I also think investment trusts are sometimes overlooked. They're a big part of our market in the UK. A lot of them right now are trading on pretty meaty discounts. Um, you know, I've, I've got a sort of soft spot for Polar Capital, for example, but there's, there's loads. And I would also, if people want diversified exposure, you know, I'd recommend a sort of closed end investment trust. Um, so, yeah, I mean, be liberal, look around, look at different markets. Um, don't be afraid of things you don't know. Vietnam is an amazing country. Look at the Vietnamese stuff that you can. I mean, um, does that help? Is that it's broad based, but yeah, yeah, I that's, guess... a, that's a really good, good reply. What I wanted to touch on, though, for our you know, newer listeners and um, less experienced listeners, how would somebody go about accessing the Vietnam market or the Japanese market? Are you talking about ETFs there? Are you talking about investment yeah. trusts? How do yeah. you go about accessing those, Alex? So, so ETFs um, around themes and concepts yeah. and sometimes mm -hmm. geographies and the big suppliers are the ones I, I, I name checked. So you can just yeah, Google them. Check them yeah. Or alternatively go via any of the platforms, Hargreaves, Lansdowne and so on. Um, II is very good. They're all good. We've got a very good personal finance framework in this company. Um, Vietnam, um, I mean, Dragon Capital is a very good fund manager in Dragon Capital, UK based, but but specializes in Southeast Asia. Um, Japan, Schroeder's Japan, very good. Most of the big fund management groups will have equity strategies around these markets. You tend to only hear about the UK ones because we're in London or the UK. And they're very good, but they also run global strategies, multi-asset asset strategies. And so the information is normally there on the website with the prospectus. Um, you just need to search it out, really. But ETFs are a great, great way of getting exposure to concepts um, and, and themes and, and provide very good liquidity. So that, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a sort of taster of, of, of how I would do it. Thank you for that. I fully appreciate it. Now, investors should always aim to be rewarded for long-term investing in the market versus trying to time the markets. I think we're agreed upon that, Alex. Which stocks have you held in your own investing portfolio for the longest? And what are the characteristics that helped you to maintain your conviction through in the, the market cycles that we've had over the past decade or so? Yeah, I mean, really, that 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 is largely US, I must be honest. Um, and that's generally been companies like Microsoft, um, what, what you know, what we used to call Google, but which is now Alphabet. Um, obviously, our friends, NVIDIA, that we've talked about on other pods. 
um, I was a big buyer quite early on into large cap tech, what what used to get called fan or, or fan mag. Fan, yeah. Um, and what gave me conviction? I think really just the sense that um, they had sustainable and diversified business models. Um, so, for example, with Microsoft, you not only had Office 365, but you had, you know, you had you had the gaming side of it. You had the LinkedIn side of it. Do, do you know what I mean? You had Bing i.e. search advertising for, for those that don't know um so these techs companies are are that are they are often more diversified than you think and often they have revenue streams which are sort of hedging each other um so you sort of sort of you sort of anticipated that would play out but as the years have gone by it has played out um and then the other narrative which i think really played out for me i mean in my late 40s now so really Time in the market for me is money that was put into my funds in the early 2000s and then into 2010. And of course, that coincided with the GFC, global financial crisis, and zero rates. And so basically, long, long duration assets, tech companies, did very well from zero interest rates between about 2009 and like two years ago. Because um, you were valuing things on, on like very low discount rates tech companies where the cash flows might not be for 10 20 years but it, really building up value in the terminal value so i got lucky pete to be honest i knew a bit about tech 10 to 15 years ago i didn't know the gfc was going to happen but i sort of accepted the warren buffett logic which is the us is just this amazing country full of innovation and i, I basically switched to the us and i've sort of largely stayed there since closer to home it's been a bit more about being nimble, to be honest. Um, I, I wish I could say we've got a UK fan, but we don't. Um, so it's often a question about being nimble around themes and concepts and, and trends. Um, what we tend to have in the UK that they don't have in the US is we, we tend to have companies that scale to a certain size and then get taken over. Sadly. You and I talked about this a lot. Yeah. So your exit strategy for a lot of companies, maybe NCC, for example, your exit strategy for a lot of our mid caps will be it will get taken over. And that will generally lead to a fairly hefty premium over where the shares have been trading at. And that's your sort of happy goodbye to those to those stories. Um, mm. I can't point to too many UK compounders. Compounder is a company that does the same thing year in, year out. There's one called yeah. For Imprint, For Imprint which is a UK yep. quoted US promotional goods company. It's got a great business model and has compounded steadily over a 10 year period. I used to work with them. Um, but but of that aside, and rightly, if I can't think of too many, to be honest, in the UK, um, it's, it's tended to be US led. Um, but what I'm looking for is recurring revenues, a moat, scalability, that's important, and um, good management. Brilliant. No, I love that reply. And you've, you've, you've answered my question as well, because I was going to ask you about what your favourite companies are at the moment and subsectors right now, but I think you've covered that. I want to ask now, because I think you've touched on it a little bit, uh, what do you make of the, the lowly plight of U, the UK stock market versus that of its UK, US peers? Because we seem to have a, a huge disparity going on regarding the valuations of US companies, not only the tech companies, the ordinary companies as well, versus our UK listed companies, you know, some of them have got massive revenues in the US. There seems to be a massive discount. What, what, it's, why, is yeah. it, why is it continuing? Do you know, right. do you know what? It's, it is a real, it's, it's quite sad. And um, mm. it's sort of, um, it needs to be corrected. I mean, I think we're now 25, 26 months of non-stop redemptions from UK equities, like 500 mil a month, every month. Um, I mean, that's billions and billions and billions of pounds of assets under management leaving the UK market. Um, why is it happening? I mean, it's a bit of everything, isn't it? A bit of Brexit, a bit of MIFID, a bit of the UK political situation being a bit sort of suboptimal, um, a bit of other markets being more attractive. I mentioned Japan. Japan, Japan was flatlining for many years, but has now come back into focus. That'll be sucking money out of UK funds into Japanese equity yeah. strategies. Um, a bit of a bit of not many interesting companies listing in the UK. Well, you know why bother if there's nothing to invest in that you want to? The UK has always been very value oriented, so it's always been good for dividends, banks, insurers, the big oil companies. That profile hasn't really changed 
as long as I've worked in, in the UK market. I can't really see it changing, to be honest. Um, how do we get more people interested in the UK? Well, just the other day, I think there were some reforms announced by Jeremy Hunt about getting, you know, the long term insurers to invest more in, in unlisted equities. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that will happen, but it but it sounds good. Scrapping MIFID 2 for me is a no brainer for anybody who doesn't know what that is. Basically, six or seven years ago, there was some regulation that basically said, you know, you can't really distribute or publish research unless there are sort of onerous regulatory um, agreements between fund managers and, 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 and suppliers. Unfortunately, what it's meant is that there's a real dearth of coverage on companies below a market cap of 200 mil. And, and they are the very companies that need research, that need promotion, that need help, that may need to raise capital. And often there's almost nothing to talk about with them because nobody writes about them. There's no liquidity. So I think short answer to your question, I think everything needs to turn around. Um, it looks like the government and the regulators are on the case, which is good. Um, but I won't hold my breath because it's been going on a while. And and I, and I think my message to UK investors would be, you know, when you're looking at the fundamentals of a small cap or a mid cap or a micro cap, that's great and that's necessary work. Also consider things like liquidity. What's the volume? If you buy 100,000 shares in company X, 50 million quid, are you going to be able to sell them? Or are you just going to have to take a price from the market maker, which may be on the back of a massive spread, no volume. So liquidity, unfortunately, it's become quite a big issue in the UK market. I don't see that changing in the short to medium term. It's frustrating, it should be better than it is, but we are where we are. And, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will turn. Um, we could do some more good IPOs, that will help. In terms of the valuation disconnect, I mean, UK has always been a relatively lowly valued market. Again, reflecting the sort of low growth, big dividend payers. Um, is that gonna change? I mean, not really. I don't think so. It might change a little bit on the upside. It doesn't appear to be okay, sucking so, in capital so, at the moment. Let me just ask you this then. What what do you foresee then as a possible catalyst for positive sentiment going forward for the UK market? Because we need something as a catalyst going forward. And it's not going to be solely down to Jeremy Hunt saying pension funds, you know, can you, you invest in these low, these small companies and these startups and these aimlessed and scaling companies? We need something well, else. I mean, at the time we're recording this, Pete, the inflation rate is what, eight and a half? And macro, and we're not yeah. growing, we're zero. So we've basically got stagflation. Yeah. So yeah. stagflation is not an attractive calling card for investors. Um, so we need to get inflation down. I think that will happen. Maybe not for a little while, but it is, it is gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to stimulate the supply side to generate more growth. Um, because if you're growing at one or 2% as an economy, it's just not very attractive. Um, so there's loads of, I think, personally, it's easy for me to say, but I think there's loads of minor micro reforms to the supply side from degrees, qualifications, apprenticeships, make it easier to employ people, um, you know, teach people digital skills. I mean, they're, 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 there's a lot, but these things are not very sexy, but there's lots of little things we can do to make the economy more robust. I, I worry slightly that we don't have enough digital skills amongst our sort of younger cohorts, our kids. I mean, they're very good at TikTok, but I mean, how many of them, do you know what I mean? How many of them are? Digitally coders? natives, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so mm -hmm. UK macros, we've got to grow at more than two and we've got to get inflation down. We've got to sell London to, to international investors. We've got to get rid of MIFID too. And, um, give the impression of political stability not getting involved in politics yeah. on this podcast no, let's not go there no but that's, yeah. that's a good call now i've got i'm conscious i've had you only here for a little while i've got two questions for you remaining for you to expand on and tell people where you are and what you're doing um so talk about all the social media stuff that you're doing um other media um content that you're, you're working on blogs etc there's a particular podcast i know that you're working on as well yeah so tell well, share people tell them where you can find you etc yeah, i've got sure. one final question after that Thank you. Well, I'm working with you and Henry on the Twin Peaks podcast, which is fortnightly. And, um, we're, you know, we're liking that format and that's going well. And we're talking about the market and companies 
in a sort of user friendly, good natured way. Um, that's really enjoyable for me. Um, I post bits and pieces on things like LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, I my background is mainly in sort of media and tech and publishing. So I, I work with um, a friend of mine, Colin Morrison, on a blog called Flashes and Flames, which is published every Friday, which is, is, is really for people that work in the sort of media or publishing industry. But nevertheless, I think has broad appeal too. Um, and and I, I get asked to, you know, to go on CNBC every now and again to talk about, you know, Sky, Comcast, Google, the, the tech scene, generally consumer tech rather than business tech. Um, and I take part in various conferences and I'm working on a few other things behind the scenes, which hopefully will see the light of day later this year. I'm a massive believer in social media, massive believer in YouTube, democratization of content um, and and personal finance. I do I do believe. There's a job of work to be done in the UK, marrying personal finance with a better understanding of the stock market. I think we're sort of we've got the bits in place, but we haven't linked them up, and 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 that's one of the things you and I have talked about. I believe in that. Indeed. Um, so so yeah. So I, I'm in the luxurious position now where I don't really need to work, but I still want to work. And um, and you're young enough. You're young enough, mate. So mate, and I love markets and 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 technology and 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 you know finding out new stuff. So intellectually, the passion is still there. Um, but thank God I don't need to get up at six o'clock in the morning anymore or, you know, all that stuff, which, yeah, you can do it. I think you can do it, but it has a cost and the cost is physical, a little bit mental and also in terms of the family life. And, you, you know, I've got kids and a wife and, and aging parents like most of us. So I've got lots of other responsibilities that I need to sort of turn to um, and be part of my community and, and help give back. I do a bit of football coaching, a bit of cricket coaching um, and, 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 and various other chores for people. So, you know, all of this is very fulfilling for me um, and is easier to do when I don't have to sort of, you know, go to the office every day. I love the fact you're touching the balance, life balance there and also giving back to your community and being part of your community. I think it's very, very important that we all show some kindness to what's going on around us as well. And being alert to it, I think when when we're so focused on our work and having to travel and da -da -da, we, we, we miss everything else that's going on outside of it. We, we end up so blinkered. So, you know, knowing what's going on in your community is so important and, and being able to do I, something about it, you know, yeah, is I, very important I, as well. I, I, I really, I really feel that strongly too. And I sort of feel as though COVID was a two year period where we're all sort of locked up and Absolutely. I want to come out the other side of that now and be a bit more open and help where I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the fact that we've got these platforms and channels that we never used to have, which give us connectivity. And I like using them. So. Brilliant. No, I, I look forward to hearing more about Flashes and Flames as well. Listen, I've got one final question for you, Alex. And I think you've covered this a little bit, but I'm going to ask you to expand on it if you if you have. Um, if there's one thing within your power, and I'm giving you the magic wand now to do whatever you want to do, that you could change for the long term betterment of all investors, including your your children, you know, when they when they inherit your wealth, and no doubt, and your and your wife's wealth. Um, what would you do, and what and why, Alex? What would you change for the betterment of all investors? Um, OK, so I would give all kids at the age of 16. Um, two to three hours a week of personal finance teaching. You know, can you fill in a tax return? Do you understand how tax works? Do you know what a pension is? Um, can you what's your basic arithmetic like? Um, and and all that stuff, it may not be very sexy, but I think as a society, we're slight our kids are struggling you know with concepts in personal finance so i would institute education i mean i'm a big one for things like learning mechanics as well but i'm a big one for practical skills and i think that's probably what i would do i would try and get into the schools and colleges you know um the building blocks for, for managing your personal finances and and you know, the classic stuff about footballers earning loads of money and then and then sort of spaffing it all away. That should not happen. Um, so I think that's probably what I would do. Um, yeah, I think that would be my that would be my main 
contribution to the debate. Brilliant. No, I love that reply. I think financial education is, is so vital. We've got so many people that are financially illiterate. And as a consequence now, you know, they're looking at their, their mortgages, they're looking at their rents, and they're looking at the cost of living and they're going, I don't know what to do, you know, and there's not enough support for them. So, yeah, I think that'd be great, especially if you've learned that at 16, not, you know, not trying to learn it now at our age, you know, late 40s or, you know, mid 50s. It's very, very difficult to actually attain that. But it's not, yeah. it's not undoable. It's, you know, it's possible to still learn at our age, but it's easier to learn it earlier. You know, to prevent the mistakes happening later on. I think putting the, putting the building blocks in place. I mean, absolutely. These days, you know, if you graduate college these days, twenty one, twenty two, you're probably going to have an auto enrolment pension, DC pension. You know, what is it? What are you going to do with it? How much should I put in? How much can I afford to put in? What does it actually mean? What are my options? You know, time in the market is better than timing the market, as as we agree. And so, therefore, mm. if you're starting that process mid twenties power of compounding means things could look pretty good by the time you're in your mid-40s what does that then mean for the next phase of your life i mean that, that, that i suppose that's where i'm getting it and the other thing that's changed since we were we were much younger of course is that you've got to pay to go to uni these days so you've got to be yes, savvy indeed. about how this is going to play out um so yeah personal Absolutely. finance at a young age brilliant no i, I love that response I, i'm ever so pleased that you came on here with me um, on the Investing Matters uh, podcast, um, Alex. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Uh, ladies and gents, um, that's the conclusion of my interview with Alex de Groot, the former sell-side TMT specialist analyst with numerous investment banks, finance houses, brokerage firms, stockbrokers. Nearly three decades of experience for you to listen to. I hope you enjoy this and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Alex, thank you ever so much. Take care. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Investing Matters. Be sure to check out the London Southeast website for free tools and info to research your next investment. You can also join in the conversation on our social media channels. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content, including our CEO interviews. Catch you next time.